compared various software products um, doing the same thing on the exact same hardware, um, looking at how much energy they consumed. This is a comparison of two word processors. They only identify one as proprietary and one as open source. Open source is on the left uh, in green, and the proprietary one is on the right in blue. And what they found is doing the exact same thing, the proprietary word processor consumed four times the energy compared to word processor one, the open source one. They don't identify what the software is. You can probably guess. Um, what about the platform, Mac or Windows? I think it was Windows, okay. if I remember correctly. Okay. Um, so they find that it's it, it, uh, yeah, four, time, uh, four times more energy consumed to do the same thing. Um, for you know, a single user, this may not be that significant. We're not talking about huge numbers here, um, but you can't think about this in terms of individuals. There's a word processor in every university, in every home, um, on every laptop, right? The numbers add up once you start to scale. And I wanna do a back of the envelope calculation. This is taken from a course um, from the Hasso Platner Institute about sustainable software design. Um, in which it's just a simple calculation looking at what happens when you take a one CPU second reduction in a, uh, a program, um, what that means in terms of energy uh, consumption when you, when you scale it up. So in this example, one uh, CPU second reduction is the equivalent to about 10 watt seconds. So you save 10 watt seconds for each transaction. If you multiply that by 1.5 million users, it's not very many. You know, many software products, you have many more users than that. But let's use the numbers that are used in the, in the uh, example here. And assume that there's 20 such interactions that have that one CPU uh, second reduction for 230 working days a year. That's the equivalent to 19 megawatt hours savings. Now, 19 megawatt hours, what does that mean? Um, to give a comparison, if you were to take an electric vehicle, a modern one, drive it from Paris to Beijing, you can go back and forth 19 times from a one CPU second reduction. Okay, so these numbers add up once you start scaling it up. And I've been using this example and uh, giving this talk now for about a year and a half in the KDE Eco Project. And I've been trying to convince people this is important and we should think about these things. If I can convince 500 developers just to get 10 of those reductions, right, and you, you multiply that out, what you end up with is roughly the en energy equivalent of 30,000 two-person households, so a small city. These are achievable goals, right? These are not uh, uh, unachievable things, and they make a difference when you start scaling it up. Okay, so now I wanna talk about uh, conservation. Um, this is data, it's a bit old now, it's from 2016, but this is what I have, um, looking at the um, e-waste. So uh, we're talking about con conservation, let's talk about where our devices land when we're done with them uh, in the bin. Um, what happens, uh, so how much is that and what's the contribution to the environmental harm? Um, the estimate in 2016, and these numbers are only going up, is that the amount of waste would be the equivalent to the material to build 4,500 Eiffel Towers. If you were to stack those Eiffel Towers, that's roughly the equivalent to the height of 17 Mount Everest. Okay, and this is in 2016. Um, there's already uh, a huge increase in the numbers I saw for 2019 and, and certainly only going up. Did you have a question? I was wondering if that was actually uh, just for the year. This is just for 2016, yeah. And um, what's, what's worse, the numbers get worse, uh, the only 20% of e-waste gets recycled or less than 20%, so it's not very much. And of the waste that's in a landfill, it contributes about 2%, um, but it contributes 70% of the toxic waste. What does software have to do with this, right? That's hardware. Software plays a role in how long you can use hardware. So software-driven uh, hardware obsolescence, abandonware, planned obsolescence, you have uh, you know, uh, notifications uh, when you have the newest update that says this device is no longer supported. I've had this happen to a couple family members and have convinced them to switch to Linux um, because of it. Um, it bloat and feature creep uh, means the software is getting more and more, requiring more and more from the hardware. You know, device doesn't meet minimum system requirements. What this means is that new devices are produced and shipped unnecessarily. These are functioning devices. 
um, and functioning devices end up discarded as e-waste. It's a software problem. Not all of it, but some of it is, right? And a big part of it is. And this should be way more scandalous than it is. That people tolerate this is, is unbelievable to me. To get an idea of what that means in terms of contributions in greenhouse gas emissions, this is from a report from Apple. Um, I got this from a book called Smarta Guna Welt. It's based on the actual data from Apple itself. And uh, I'll translate the German. Um, the uh, production of an iPhone uh, Model 7, um, this is uh, from a few years ago, I think 2019 was the data, um, was 78% of the greenhouse gas emissions of the device over its uh, lifespan. The 18% uh, is for the usage, and then transport is 3%, and uh, um, end-of-life treatment, and Sorgung, is 1%. If you just take the transportation, uh, end-of-life treatment, and production, you're over 80% of the contributions of that device to the uh, greenhouse gas emissions of the device over its lifespan. Okay? So it has a huge production, has a huge environmental impact. End-of-life treatment has a huge, sorry, just a comment? I don't know, I'm sorry. Um, if anyone else knows what the... Four and a half, four years. So I, I think, yeah, I think something like four years. I was gonna say two and a half to three years is like the average sure. lifespan of, but I don't know what that no, those numbers are based on. Yeah, the, the average motor user expectation is two and a half. Okay. So regardless of the lifespan, it's probably getting in front of the wall much sooner. Much sooner. Yeah. Um, but I'll look it up, it's a good question. Um, and I don't know what the data was that they used for this particular uh, calculation. Um, envir environmental impact of end of life treatment. This is a picture from Ghana where many devices land. It's one of the many uh, countries, um, uh, you know, non-Western countries where our devices end up and then get uh, dismantled and uh, metals that can be extracted or they try to extract them. Um, this has huge uh, costs to the health of the people doing it. Uh, many of these metals are toxic, um, has huge costs to the environment in which they're doing it, um, to the air, to the water, to the soil. Um, yeah, there's an environmental cost of uh, discarding our devices, and if it's done unnecessarily, you know, we should try to prevent that. And I think there's an important discussion to have, and this is looking at, so there's, there's, there's going to be a point when Less efficient hardware is actually going to be contributing more than getting a new device, and which is more efficient and running. And this idea of relative harm, so like there's a sweet spot where you wanna upgrade to more efficient hardware because using it will actually consume less over time, right? But those are very difficult numbers to calculate. We need some data to have an understanding of what's the relative harm when we're talking about making choices, right? And this I just wanted to give as an example, this is for e-readers. This is again from the same book, uh, Smarta Guna Welt, um, in which they look at what would be the, um, at which point does um, buying a paper book um, outweigh the cost that it would take to produce an e-reader, right? An e-reader you can read um, hundreds, thousands of books on, um, and it's one device. So you produce it once, and then you have that opportunity to use it for a very long time. Um, this calculation, they looked at the production of one e-reader. The numbers they have here is it takes 15 kilograms of different materials, uh, many of them non-renewable metals, um, 300 liters of water, and uh, um, it contributes about 170 kilograms of CO2 to produce one e-reader. The environmental harm equivalent, according to this estimate, would be if you read less than 30 to 60 books, depending on the size, assuming you don't share the book, um, it is better to have the paper book. If you read over 30 to 60 books, it's better to have the e-reader in terms of the environmental harm, okay? One of the things I wanna point out here, because I'm talking about software, is what is the lifespan of these devices? Yeah. A year or in total, a year or less? In total, this is over the lifespan of the device in these calculations. Um, the, I looked online, Wikipedia has an article about e-readers, and there are 71 devices listed as unsupported, and of those, they have intro year and uh, end year, start year, end year, whatever, that's on average one and a half years, 
right? So, so I don't know what that means in terms of software support for those devices. I'm assuming it's not very much longer after those uh, end of uh, support for the device itself. Um, I also looked at a Gallup poll to get some ideas of, um, so Gallup is a, a, a polling agency in the United States, uh, probably internationally, but I know from the United States, and they uh, had a statistic, and I think it was 57% uh, of US Americans read between zero and five books a year, and 15% um, read between six and 10. So that's about 80% of the population. Assuming for that population, what they would need, they would need to use a device for at least 10 years to get the environmental, uh, uh, relatively less harmful choice, right? Most people probably aren't doing that. And in fact, the authors have a nice quote in which they say, it is questionable whether all e-readers e sold before they break or become technically obsolete, again, are used so intensively on average that an overall ecological benefit is achieved. This is one example, I think it's a nice example because you can make a direct comparison. Smartphones are much harder. You do a lot more with a smartphone, or even if for reading books, so you can compare to one object. Um, the point I wanna make here though is that uh, we need data, right? We need a way to uh, estimate what is the relative harm so we can have this conversation. Which gets me to the next topic. Um, eco-certifying desktop software. So who here is familiar with the Blue Angel eco-label? So most of you. Um, so sometimes I start this talk uh, by asking what does the Blue Angel eco, what does the Blue Angel, sorry, back up, what does toilet paper and software have in common? They can both be eco-certified. Blue Angel is most well known in Germany and in German-speaking countries for certifying paper and toilet paper and other paper products. Um, and uh, as of 2020, they now uh, eco-certify software. Many people are surprised um, that there is such a thing as eco-certification for desktop software. What does that mean? Um, and that's what I'm gonna spend uh, the next part talking about and then digging into what the criteria are and how free software fits in with that. One thing about the award criteria is they're very well aligned with FOSS values. Um, you don't have to be free and open source software to be eco-certified with the Blue Angel, um, but they're recognizing that transparency and user autonomy are crucial for sustainable software. The award criteria um, are in three main categories, resource and energy efficiency, measuring your software, publishing the results, potential hardware operating life, keeping devices in use, and uh, user autonomy. So to take a look at this a bit more in detail, um, the energy resource and energy efficiency requires measuring your software in different uh, uh, ways. Um, one is idle mode, how much does the energy, how much energy is consumed when the software is running idle? We're gonna see in a second an example of uh, how that really can make a difference. Um, as well as standard usage scenarios. Defining what is a typical use case of that software, what are the most frequently used uh, functionalities, um, defining a five minute long usage scenario, measuring it, doing it 30 times, getting the results and publishing it. Also requires identifying what are the minimum system requirements to run that software, um, as well as does it support energy saving modes. For potential hardware operating life, uh, they require that you demonstrate it can run on hardware that's at least five years old. I think that's way too low. Um, that's 2018. Um, I know myself and several other people are using computers that are much older than that running Linux. Um, and the user autonomy criteria, um, which include things like uninstallability and modularity, continuity of support, uh, documentation, open support for open standards, on installation, how do you do that, uh, privacy policies, transparency, is it open source, um, offline capability, uh, can users choose to turn off advertising. And I'm gonna dig into each of these in just a moment, but I just wanna say that KDE is very proud of Ocular um, for being the first eco-certified product um, in the global eco-labeling network, of which Blue Angel is one of them. So, uh, good job, uh, Ocular developers. Um, went through the process of documenting compliance with the award criteria that you just saw, submitted it, it took a few months, and uh, were eco-certified. So software design for the environment. So I'm gonna go through these different criteria and try to pull out what, how they relate to um, 
um, uh, environmentally, environmentally friendly s uh, software design. I'm going to start here looking at energy consumption, hardware performance, and uninstallability and modularity, and maybe something related to offline uh, usage. I'm not sure, and you'll see why in just a second. Um, what's my time? Oh, I have plenty of time. Great. Um, so it, software, Linux users are, uh, um, we take it for granted that you can uninstall things, right? <laughs> Like, this is obvious to us. Uh, I don't think anyone thinks about the fact that you can just write, you know, a command and completely remove a piece of software and all of its dependencies um, and leave all of your, your own data um, at the same time. Um, this is something that, again, not all software allows. And uh, when you have all of those components that accumulate um, on your device, um, I just need to check my notes here, what I wrote. Um, so you have, uh, um, you know, you're wasting processing time when you start the application, maybe when you're running the application because it's doing things that uh, you don't want, um, you're adding disk usage to your device, um, you're consuming storage, you're maybe causing delays um, in use of other software, it's creating inefficiencies. And when you think back to um, the example here of the two word processors, right, um, how much of what's happening in the proprietary one are things that people can't decide to remove? Right, the modularity requirement says that you should be able to install what you need and not more. The uninstallability says if you don't need it, you should be able to un uninstall it, right? How much of this is contributing from things that users don't have a choice to remove from their system? Um, here's an example from that same report. This is looking at the um, word processors over time. So the x-axis is showing the seconds. Um, y-axis is showing power power consumption, and what you see here, I'm gonna focus on everything that's happening at this sort of blue line. Um, this is the point in time when the word processor saves the document and goes idle. Um, is that like second position to mention certain proprietary software may be saving faster than one drive compared to local state and the second position? So today, if you have like two tables, you would you know, maybe power save them, so that's the other question. Very different price. Uh, yes, this should be, yes, only only local uh, computing, okay. yeah, yeah. What's being measured here is the, um, yeah, yeah. And, and maybe I, I, I should mention that, and I will come back to this in just a second, the way they're measuring it is they have a system plugged into an external power meter, and the data is coming from that external power meter. And this is uh, when looking at what's happening over time, doing various things. Um, the most important one I'm gonna focus on here is the point in time when it's saved and goes idle. You can see on the bottom graph, which is the open source program, um, the application does in fact go idle, right? It does stop doing things. And the proprietary one is doing a bunch of stuff. And what it's doing is not uh, uh, outlined in the report. Um, I don't know that it's that easy to find out. I mean, maybe you could find out in indirect ways. Um, if it were open source software, you could take a look at the code and try to figure out what's going on here. Um, proprietary software, you can't do that. Um, proprietary software may not give users, it's the user's dependent on the vendor to decide how they use it. They may not be able to shut that off, right? So when I, this could be telemetry, I don't know, that's why I put a question mark, but if it were, you know, can users opt out? or better following the policy of KDE, is it opt-in by default, right? It's gonna contribute to the kind of energy consumption that's happening when running that software. And just to reiterate the point, again, think about this at scale. When you scale it up, you're talking about um, a lot of energy being consumed, potentially unnecessarily. Okay. Um, this is the next one, uh, potential hardware operating life, and I'm gonna look at it um, in particular in terms of continuity of support, documentation, and transparency. So the idea here is to, uh, you know, have a counteract the abandoned wear and planned obsolescence and things like this. Um, this is, uh, uh, you know, this is a proprietary uh, hardware. Um, the reason I'm showing it here is for a particular reason. I asked around in the KDE community um, what hardware they're, that's older than five years old that they're running that they know is no longer supported by the vendors. I'm wondering if anyone here, do you know if you're using a piece of hardware running Linux 
that's no longer supported by the vendors of that hardware, for example, uh, Apple or, or Microsoft devices? You mean like you can extend this, like you can kind of just use Apple Pay even that it's not tech? Say it again, say it again. Sorry. Yes, so, so this example, this is from 2009, yeah. this piece of hardware. The end of life was 2019 okay. with OS X 10.10. 10. Okay. So this is already four years, no longer supported by Apple. I don't mean even touch that, okay. Yeah. And this user is running Kubuntu 22.04, long-term support and up-to-date uh, operating system with Plasma. Right, so, so this, this, is, this is a device that would otherwise end up in the trash or result in the user having um, you know, serious disadvantages to keep using it, exposing themselves to malware, things like this. Um, but because they can install another operating system on it, they can keep it going, right? Does anyone else here? So I know I am at home. I also have a device from like 2010. Yeah. So I see a couple of hands going up. Yeah. Yeah, right. So, 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 so software, right, <laughs> is a contributor to whether you can continue using it or not. Yeah. yeah. And um, whether that software can be used will depend on things like documentation. Like, do you have good documentation so that people can continue developing it? Is the, is the source code open source? Is there someone that's able to continue giving um, security updates? If it's not open source, the Blue Angel requires that you have a plan and a, a commitment to supporting it for up to five years, right? But if it's not, if you don't have that plan, you can open source it and continue developing it as third parties. I'm not sure if we kind of still wait until the end, but like if this guy's distribution can help or make it work like on a big platform, so imagine that you can replace a lot of systems or distributions. So like if this is what we want to do, so suddenly nothing, I don't know, more than five years can go around. I'm thinking maybe we should go, you know, go to the market with this. We can make it w worse. Yeah, like if we go, if we go V3 only, then you know we kind of have a fault. In the right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, I had the experience with PowerPC. I have a few old PowerPC devices that really there's very few distributions that you can still run on it, um, and they're still functioning. I don't know if it's worth running, but they still work fine. Yeah, sure, sure. And usually, it's the browser that's the biggest problem. Um, once you open up a browser, it gets uh, pretty difficult. Um, so, so yeah, so the continuity of the support, documentation, transparency are all things that are can contribute to whether you can continue to use these devices um, over time. And then the final uh, categories I'm gonna look at are again, energy consumption in terms of offline capability and freedom for advertising. Um, this is from a report for the EU looking at um, the energy consumption of unwanted data use is the way they're rephrasing, rephrasing it. This is just looking at the energy consumption within the EU. And they're looking at what they define as unwanted data use is the advertising that users can't turn off or can't opt out of that um, given a poll, 60% said they would. So that 60% that would opt out if they could but can't are uh, then estimated how much energy consumption that, that is contributing um, the energy consumption, of course, coming from the devices themselves, but also the networks that the information is flowing through, as well as the data centers that are processing the data, perhaps mining the user behavior to then give them targeted advertisements, et cetera. And what they found is just for the EU, that 60% uh, unwanted data use is roughly the equivalent to three to eight million metric tons of CO2. That would be about the equivalent, in the best case, 350,000 EU citizens annual energy consumption. Worst case, 950,000 um, uh, uh, EU citizens energy consumption. And this is about, and the worst case is about the size of a city like Turin. So the, I mean, this is huge energy uh, waste um, for something users don't even want, right? So the Blue Angel has put in their award criteria, uh, freedom from advertising, offline use, as being a way of making sustainable software design. Again, these are things that we in the uh, Linux world, you know, most Linux apps are not doing this kind of stuff. Um, if they were, we could change it, you know? Uh, so, so yeah, so free and open source software is in a very different position than many of the other software providers. And one of the things when looking at the um, 
overall, all of the criteria, the user autonomy in particular, are removing user dependencies on vendors for how they use software, right? They're removing those dependencies that make software um, function in ways that they may not want and are contributing to environmental harm. All of this is uh, part of a project, um, which was the Blaue Engel for FOSS project um, in KDE, um, which was a, uh, it ended in March. Um, it was a, um, a government funded project from the German government to um, collect information, spread information about uh, Blaue Engel eco certification and how it relates to free software. And the culmination of this project is a eco, KDE eco handbook, which was released in February. Um, it's available uh, to download, um, applying the Blue Angel criteria to free software. And in it, uh, we want to share the information and experiences that we've had over the past year and a half. Um, summing up the main sort of things, if you're interested in eco-certifying or if you're interested in measuring your, your uh, software to get some uh, data about how much energy it's consuming, um, sum it up in three easy steps, right? It's good to have threes and keep things easy. Measure, analyze, and certify if you want to go for the certification process. Um, the handbook is, is divided up into three parts. Um, part one is that first part of this talk here. What is the environmental impact uh, uh, related to software? So the why, why is this important? Why should you care? The second part is what? What is the Blue Angel? What is uh, the eco certification uh, criteria, et cetera? And the third part is the how to. Um, how do you fulfill these criteria if you're interested in eco certifying your software? Um, you don't have to eco certify, you can still measure it and still look at all the ways that your software is meeting environmentally or more environmentally friendly software design and use that as a way to communicate with your users about how your software is um, you know, more sustainable. Um, we've just, um, I'm very uh, happy to announce that Season of KDE um, just wrapped up last week and we had a project which is looking at different ways of writing research scenario scripts. One uh, was very successful, adding a new chapter, hopefully in the next week or two, um, describing how to use Selenium um, so that you can do usage scenario uh, testing and it also allows us then to test in Wayland. Um, so yeah, so keep your eyes out. There are updates coming to it and hopefully that will continue over, um, yeah, over many years. Um, it's also available online if you prefer to read it online. So you can download it or read it online. Um, just to give you an idea of what the lab setup looks like, I didn't focus too much on that in this talk. Um, the lab setup is uh, you have a system under test which is connected to an external power meter. This is one approach. Um, and then those are both uh, feeding data into a third, uh, second computer that you then can analyze the results with. Very simple setup. Um, we had several sprints. Several people in this room were at those sprints. Uh, so thank you to Volker, Nico, Tobias, um, as well as Arna, who's in this picture here. Um, we had a lot of fun getting together, setting up the lab, uh, testing things. Here we're testing the energy consumption of a light bulb to calibrate. Um, so yeah, so it was a fun time. We have this lab set up. It's in KDAV. So right now to use it, you have to contact someone who's in Berlin to go run your scripts but we have a project that's in the pipeline to make it remotely accessible and we want to open it up to other free and open source software developers so that they can measure their software and get an idea of how much energy it's consuming and if they want, get a report and submit it for eco-certification. Um, the report, there's already a piece of software. It's, it's particular, um, but it already exists to get you results so that you can um, certify or get a summary of the, the data. From the lab, it's called OSCAR, the Open Source uh, Consumption Analysis and R tool. Um, right now, it's only in German. Um, I, I don't know what their plans are. Um, it's free and open source, so we could uh, improve it and contribute back. But right now, you uh, give various uh, uh, CSV files with your data in various uh, usage scenario, idle mode, baseline measurements, um, feed it to the um, uh, software, and it gives you back a report. In the handbook, if you do, do, do decide to do this, in the handbook, I, I describe how the data needs to look for this to work. It's very particular. If something is different, it, you'll get an error. Um, so, yeah, it, and, and you can lose a lot of time from experience trying to figure out what the error is. And KDE in October at Academy um, voted on three goals, which are sort of orienting the community over the next three years. One of those goals is the sustainable software goal. Um, we have a monthly meetup in which we discuss um, 
various aspects related to uh, software efficiency, software design, et cetera. Um, so keep an eye out if you want to see what's going on in KDE in terms of sustainable software. And I'm going to end here. I have in the slides uh, some other projects that are worth looking into. Um, but I do think this is something that is worth you know, asking, is this all worth it? Um, right? Like, I, at the very beginning, I was talking about you know, training AI models, the energy consumption doubling you know, probably every few hours at this point. Um, right? Th this is going to be less. Uh, you know, we're talking about a different um, uh, category of uh, contribution, but there is a contribution. So one thing I would say, we, I, I hope I've convinced you, there is an environmental impact that's driven by software. But I also think there's a more important thing. So this is an XQCD where, you know, uh, um, I'm trying to fix a problem uh, with the world. Can you help? And, you know, White Hat says, it's obvious you don't actually care. If you did, you'd be trying to fix this bigger problem, right? Um, okay, you want to help me fix this bigger problem? No, for another reason I'll think of later, right? So, so the bigger problem fallacy is there's a bigger problem, so this isn't worth doing. And it's a fallacy because there's, there is, this is a problem, right? It doesn't mean that there's a bigger problem, this isn't a problem. And we here are probably, um, you know, people who can contribute to software design, documentation, things like this. We can make an impact. This is where we can have an influence, right? We can't solve maybe some of those other problems, but we can solve some of these. And I hope I've convinced you that um, your energy and your time is worth considering contributing back to helping make the environment a bit better through the choices you make in your software design. So thank you, and I think we have a couple minutes for uh, Q&A. And uh, yep. uh, uh, should I decide or? Uh, has anyone run, can, is this, you can hear it? Okay. Has anyone run any uh, benchmarks or, or studies on the OS level similar to the word processing comparison? Has that been done? Yes. So there was, again, from the Umbel Compass, um, a student who did a comparison of different OSs. The data was not published for various reasons. Um, and I know that when I've uh, been in touch to talk about it, that the response was, we feel we need to do more follow-up before we can uh, make this publicly available. So, because I, I would imagine that this row itself, that's actually a huge impact as well. Right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. This gets exposed. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Even money. All right. I'm wondering what's the correlation between uh, the software processing and uh, the power draw. If it's large-scale software running in a data center, it will obviously directly affect how many computers you need to rent. But if it's a single user computer where the processor spends most of its time being idle normally, I imagine it will take some time for the processor to, to scale the frequency and the number of cores. And maybe if I implement an optimization, it will not have a practical effect. So I can't sum that up. Sorry. Can you, can you give like a... Or is it, what's the question that I, or, or is it a comment more? Um, uh, on a single user system, if, if I make an optimization to my program that reduces the number of CPU cycles, will it di directly and linearly affect the, uh, the amount of power draw by the CPU? So I don't know, but I see someone uh, nodding their head. Do you want to? I, I can sort of answer that question a bit because when I started looking into this topic, I had a very similar intuition, like how much can I actually optimize on a desktop system? And then I, I had a power meter connected to a PC so I could actually in real time see the power consumption of various actions that I'm, I'm doing. And even things like moving the mouse had a measurable impact on the power consumption of the system and stuff like a notification pops up and that gives you a very clearly visible spike in energy consumption. So there's definitely is a lot to optimize there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. I think one more question. One more. I think I, I mean I'm I'm here, so I don't mind them. But sure. time uh, so just looking at it from the distribution building point of view, like what we can do that can really make an impact. I was like immediately when you were saying, uh, you know, uh, maybe how much, uh, how clean is the system and so on. Immediately I was thinking of the, uh, something like micro SD stop maybe, which is like very small base, very small base, like almost minimal. And you just install like what you want actually on the first view. Uh, 
in Red Hat, for example. But then I know that these are bundling a lot of you know libraries and so on. So um, in the end, you end up with multiple copies of the library. So that's that's one aspect that I'm thinking of. In the end, when you have very clean system, it's very easy to do cleanup if you need it. You always end up with clean base and then you know user side everything is clean still. And the other, so that's something that I'm thinking of. Is it like, is it going the green way or is it making it worse? And then the other thing that I think we can really impact and that have a huge impact, especially when you mentioned it should run on systems older or at least all five years. Uh, so what I was saying about base level architecture being set for the distribution, we can say, okay, we only want to compile it with optimization for CPUs which are not older than five years, which is happening already. And there you can do, you, you can make distribution unusable really on anything, I don't know, older than Haswell if you do that. And I know that enterprise distributions are doing it. On the community side, it's a little bit slower. But even open to the lead will be V2 only, V2 and newer, sorry, which makes it almost 10 years, I would say. So it's still meeting your criteria, but not the enterprise distro. That will really be the problem with five years and older. So I feel like this is something that companies don't really see. I'm not sure how many enterprise distros are certified, certificated for this, but I think that we should probably spread a little bit the awareness because they are chasing the performance, you know, like optimization, but not necessarily this effect. Yeah. And yeah. That's that's that's. I think that can make a really big difference. So if we would make lead V4 only, like then you have to use two or two or three years old CPUs, and everything else is wasted. Great, thank you. Mine would just be a comment because I know that OpenQA does generate a CSV file. So I, one thing that you brought up, maybe it would be an easy way to create something that people could actually throw into that and see how well they're doing. Just as a thought. Sure. Yeah. Okay. We're almost out of time. Does any other question? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.